The 7th of November will be a sad day in New Zealand's history. It's a day when euthanasia and assisted suicide become officially legal in New Zealand. The End of Life Choice Act will come into force. Well, the people of this country voted in a referendum and by a two to one margin they said yes. But the disturbing thing is that they said yes to a nice sounding phrase around having choice. End of life choice. We all want choice. But there's a number of problems with that. And I'll use both terms, euthanasia and assisted suicide, interchangeably. Assisted suicide is when the person who dies performs the last act. And euthanasia is when someone else, like the doctor, performs that last act. But both will be legal in New Zealand under this new law. And both have the same effect, death of the patient. So here's the problems. Firstly, we already have choice. When Kiwis were surveyed before the referendum on their understanding of what euthanasia and assisted suicide actually was, and why they wanted it legalised, it showed there was widespread misunderstanding. 85% thought the law would legalise turning off life support. 79% thought it would allow do not resuscitate requests. 67% thought it would allow the stopping of treatment or food. But a person may already refuse medical treatment. Those things are legal and they're not euthanasia. Most people simply want to ensure that the administration of pain relief and the withdrawal of burdensome treatment are not treated as illegal. And that's the case already. Allowing the natural process to take place is completely different though to intentionally bringing about the patient's death. Secondly, mistakes will be made. Some people will be euthanized on account of a disease they thought they had but did not, the diagnosis, or based on the possible outcome, the prognosis. And any doctor will tell you that both the diagnosis and the prognosis can at times be uncertain. The new law relies on a diagnosis that a person suffers from a terminal illness which is likely to end his or her life within six months. Vicky had a brain tumour, and at the time Brittany Maynard from the US had a similar brain tumour, and was the media celebrity, fighting for the right to assisted suicide. Listen to the effect it had on Vicky. I was diagnosed with the same cancer that Lucretia Seals had and died from. It was around that time I came across the story of Brittany Maynard, who was a woman that moved to Oregon in order to be able to take her own life. And she sort of became the poster girl for euthanasia. It put a lot of thoughts into my head about, like, should we be promoting this? And the way that it was, it made me feel very vulnerable. And at, even at that early stage, which was a couple of years after I was diagnosed, that maybe I was being gutless because I didn't want to take my life. It really upset me. Dave would come home from work and find me a blithering mess because all it did was put pressure on me constantly to feel that I was being selfish by not taking my life. I felt selfish because I wasn't taking my life. Isn't that a heartbreaking statement to hear from someone so vulnerable? Vicky continues. I know what it's like to be so mentally and physically exhausted that it takes effort to even pick up your head. I know exactly what that feels like. I'm not cured. I'm still terminally ill. But the fact is I was given 12 to 14 months and I have survived, um, it's almost eight years now. So if I'd bought into that whole dying thing right from the beginning, which I think to some degree you do, I probably would have missed a lot of experiences that I've really enjoyed and had a lot of fun along the way. And I think all those things I would have missed. I've got three more grandchildren since then. Um, yeah. If I'd had a legal option, I doubt I would have been here because I would have made that commitment. Yep, 12 to 14 months. And Vicky had about 10 more years. She died just this past April. The diagnosis and the prognosis, which the law is based on, will not always be accurate. In fact, sometimes it will be way off. Thirdly, coercion is a significant issue. Many will request assisted suicide because of coercion, either internally or from relatives, or concerns around the costs of treatment, and others will be struggling and even depressed, not surprisingly, because of a terminal disease prognosis, and actually just need appropriate support. The new law is seriously deficient insofar as it only requires doctors to do their best, 
to ensure that the person is free from pressure. It's an extremely low legal threshold, and moreover, it fails to outline any process for ensuring patients are free from coercion. As the New Zealand Medical Association told the Select Committee considering the new law, the provisions in the bill will not ensure that a decision to seek assisted dying will always be made freely and without subtle coercion. It won't be about the right to die, but as Vicky expressed, almost a duty to die. Claire has a spinal injury as a result of a car accident, and when she attempted suicide a number of times, she went for help. But what she got wasn't really help. The psychologist and a psychiatrist both suggested that I, I did explore assisted suicide uh, in, in places overseas, such as Switzerland. They didn't ask me about my lifestyle, my coping mechanisms. It was just, she's got a broken neck, she can't move, why would she want to live? So instead of you know committing suicide, which seems like a tragedy, assisted suicide didn't seem so bad because it was somebody helping me and it was you know controlled by the medical profession. What I didn't realise was it wasn't my broken neck that was the problem. I just didn't have the skills to cope. When I had decided that I, I didn't want to be here, um, I'd convinced myself that that was something everybody else was in agreement with as well. I guess I felt like a burden on society, on my friends, on my family. I just didn't feel like I was of value. Claire says that she felt like a burden, and that's consistent with overseas research. In Oregon, Washington State and Canada, which already allow euthanasia, the statistics show that the feeling of being a burden is one of the key reasons that terminal patients requested euthanasia. And so what if Claire had had access to assisted suicide? What if this law had already been legal? The reality is, if assisted suicide, um, if euthanasia, if it was available in New Zealand, I wouldn't be here. I'd be dead, six feet under. I was very, very pro-euthanasia, pro-assisted suicide, till about three years ago. So I spent nearly 20 years wishing that there was a bill like this in place, and, you know, even arguing for it. But in, in hindsight, it was just because I wasn't coping with my life. Even being presented with the option of, well, this could be an idea, something to consider. It's, it just, it immediately devalues my life. A disability rights group in New Zealand said, there are endless ways of telling disabled people time and time again that their life has no value. But it's not just the disability community. Elder abuse is already a significant problem in New Zealand. About 80% of it remains hidden and unreported. We cannot ignore the possibility that dependent elderly people may be coerced into assisted suicide. That feeling of being a burden on loved ones and the knowledge of that expensive rest home and geriatric care and medical bills, they're all subtle forms of coercion pushing an already vulnerable person towards a quick, cheap solution. Fourth, a human right will always expand. You can call it bracket creep or slippery slope, call it what you want. But there is concrete evidence from the countries which have introduced euthanasia that it expands to situations not initially envisaged. When a newly permitted activity is characterised as a human right, there is an inevitable push to extend such a right to a greater number of people, such as those with chronic conditions, disabilities, mental illness, those simply tired of life, or even children. Why should they not have the same right? A recent documentary in Belgium where euthanasia is allowed featured a doctor killing a healthy young woman who was struggling purely with a mental illness. Professor Theo Boer was a member of the Dutch Regional Euthanasia Commission for nine years. He was involved in reviewing 4,000 cases of euthanasia. Strong supporter of euthanasia said there was no slippery slope. However, he had a complete change of mind. 
Well, when I entered the committee in 2005, the, the numbers had been stable for a couple of years and, and also the reasons why people wanted euthanasia had been uh, stable. When I entered a couple of years later, for some reason we don't know why exactly the numbers started going up. Whereas in the first years after 2002 hardly any patients with psychiatric illnesses or dementia appear in the reports, these numbers are now sharply on the rise. Cases have been reported in which a large part of the suffering of those given euthanasia or assisted suicide consisted in being aged, lonely or bereaved. Some of these patients could have lived for years or decades. Fifth, cost may drive decisions. The new law only provides a right to one choice, premature death. There's no corresponding right for you to receive palliative care but good palliative care and hospice services are resource intensive and can be expensive. Euthanasia would be cheaper. This law change will introduce a new element of financial calculation into decisions about end of life care. And lastly, our law is a flawed and dangerous one. These are the safeguards which were voted down by the politicians who supported this law. Unlike other jurisdictions, no independent witnesses are required at any stage of the process, including at the death. The person's mental competence doesn't have to be assessed at the time the lethal dose is administered. There is no mandatory calling off period or thinking time, unlike overseas where there are specific calling periods of 9 days and up to 15 days. There is no requirement for an existing doctor-patient relationship. You can shop around for the doctor that gives you the answer you want and who doesn't know your background. Or more importantly, the family dynamics and whether there is obvious coercion going on, which a family doctor will have knowledge of. One of the worst provisions, in my view, is that the patient can block family members from being aware of their decision to have euthanasia. There is no requirement that the person discuss their request for assisted suicide with any other person. This is a serious flaw in the Act. But family members may be fully aware of why the request is being made and may have alternative solutions that don't involve killing the patient. Do you know that there were 114 amendments proposed to increase the safeguards of this new law? Of those 114, just three were approved and one of them was to have the referendum. Many of the proposed amendments weren't even debated. The select committee were given 16 months to study the bill and hear thousands of submissions, but were unable to agree that it be passed. New Zealand's law is a dangerous law. You know, one of the arguments used for not having the death penalty in New Zealand, and it was a very good reason, was what if we get one wrong? It was that fear of a mistake that was a good justification for not having the death penalty in law. How many euthanasia mistakes are we willing to accept? For example, they actually had many more years to live like Vicky, or they were just depressed and needed some hope and support. Maybe they felt like a burden and just needed to be told that they weren't, or they were driven by fear and simply needed reassurance of their treatment, their options, and most importantly, their family support. Compassion and choice were the two C words to justify this law. But opposing euthanasia doesn't mean that a person opposes compassion, and as I've already pointed out, we already have choice. The reason we oppose euthanasia is because of a number of other C words. Coercion. Not the right to die, but feeling the duty to die. Creep, in terms of bracket creep, the expansion of who qualifies. Cost factors. Unfortunately, euthanasia is a cheaper option. It's an inconvenient truth. And common conversation. Those two words, because legalised means normalised. It's no longer illegal and off the table. Euthanasia will be an actual legal and approved option. So what can you do? If you have a family member or friend facing a terminal diagnosis, be very alert. They may come to feel that euthanasia would be the right thing to do. They've had a good innings and do not want to be a burden to their nearest and dearest. They don't want to be a drain on their family's resources and time. 
This law now means that vulnerable people facing a terminal illness will be asking themselves, why should I not be accessing euthanasia? Don't give your loved ones the opportunity to even think they need to ask that question. Patients facing death have a fundamental human right, a right to receive the very best palliative care, love and support that we can give to alleviate what they may be naturally scared of, and surrounded and supported by loved ones. Here's the definition of palliative care which Hospice New Zealand uses. It is active total care for people whose illness is no longer curable. The goal is around providing quality of life, managing pain and symptoms to enable people to live every moment in whatever way is important to them. Assisting suicide is not the answer and it sends all the wrong messages when it comes to our important suicide prevention messages. Remember Vicky? She was given just over a year to live. She lived 10 more years. I truly believe that this is a, a, a public issue, not a private one. We might think individually we have the right to make these choices, whereas I think we're not actually realising the impact that these individual choices might have on other people other people that are more vulnerable than, say, myself, that aren't in a position to fight or say no, or even change their mind when it comes to the end. Someone even told me once that they felt that they were an inconvenient responsibility for their children and that their children were just waiting for them to die. We can't promote suicide awareness and think euthanasia is OK. Um, neither are OK. Please read more on our website. Be alert about this law. Go to protect.org.nz. That's protect.org.nz. We can live without euthanasia.